All right, good morning, City Light. How are we doing? All right, good morning, good morning. Uh, excited to be jumping into Philippians. If you don't have a scripture journal, which is our gift to you, so that you can get to know the Bible and the Lord more, please raise your hand. We want to go ahead and give this to you and bless you with this so that you can read it in your own time, use it in your devotions, uh, learn to read the Bible. So go ahead and raise your hand. We're going to give you one of these. Um, a couple quick things. Uh, number one, just to uh, forewarn you, I um, didn't preach last week, so I have about two weeks of Holy Spirit that I need to release. And then uh, also we spent 12 hours praying in immerse yesterday. Woo, woo, praise the Lord for that time. Uh, thank you guys for serving and being a part of that. And so I have 12 hours of the Holy Spirit as well. So uh, I have a lot to say today, so hopefully y'all can hang in there with me. Uh, a couple, one, one more, well, two important things before we jump in. The first is that June 21 through 26, we're going to have a local mission week we're calling Celebrate, in which we will celebrate our city by being totally devoted that week to serving our city. And so we're going to find lots of ways, and we're working on different partnerships in the city to be able to bless local organizations. A couple things off the bat you can go ahead and plan on. From Monday to Friday, from 5 to 8 p.m., we're running a local sports clinic for kids. So if your kids want to be involved, but also obviously for the kids in our community, um, there's going to be sign-ups available for that. You can find more information on the table in the lobby. On that Saturday, we're going to be running local block parties. And then during the day, every day, we're going to have opportunities to serve uh, by doing things at local schools or whatever it may be. So uh, this is very, very serious, a big deal for us. We want to bless and serve our city. And we want to do it together so much so that we're going to ask you to prioritize this with your time to potentially take some time off of work and to say, I'm going to use my vacation hours to serve the Lord. We want to overwhelm the city this week with an intentional effort and focus to bless, to serve, to share the gospel, and to show the love of Jesus. So that's June 21 through June 26. Mark your calendar. And particularly if you have kids or know, uh, have some friends with kids or whatever it may be, some people in the community that you know that have kids. We're running that local sports camp in which they will obviously play sports, but most importantly, they will learn about Jesus. Uh, it's going to be a great time together. We'll also need coaches for that. So if you enjoy just hanging out uh, and blessing our community that way, we would love for you to participate. So there's more information at the lobby uh, for you. Secondly, Graham Road Elementary is now letting us use their parking lot. Praises, okay? So this is good for those of you that have been driving around, wondering where to park, parking in front of fire hydrants and just risking it, whatever it might have been. Uh, now you can park at Graham Road Elementary, uh, which is just a few minute walk. So if you parked, you could walk down the sidewalk. We're also working on a shuttle to get you back from there, but we don't have that quite yet. But starting next week, uh, for those of you that are able and don't mind a few minute walk, you can use Graham Road Elementary parking lot and uh, get a little extra on your way in here and it'll be totally great, okay? So please do that if you are able. That would help us out a ton. Okay, now to the most important thing, Philippians chapter 3. Uh, this is our fifth week in our, survey, our, our sermon series in Philippians. And God has been teaching us an awful lot. And so I hope you have your pen, your scripture journal ready to mark this up with us. <clears throat> uh, to help you understand where we're after today, I want to give you a quick glimpse uh, into part of my, my past and a story here. When I was in college, okay, uh, I made a lot of good decisions, like I met my wife. And I made a lot of bad decisions, okay? So uh, this is one of those decisions. So I'm not affirming the way I was living and doing things at this time. But uh, I was a business marketing major in college, okay? At the very beginning of college. Whoa, whoa, is there another business marketing person? Okay. I don't know why that degree exists. Because people who love business don't love marketing. And people who love marketing don't love business, okay? So uh, I learned this quickly when I signed up for business marketing, I was going to go into advertising and public relations. I had no interest or desire to be a pastor. That had never crossed my mind. At this point in time in my life, I was going to go into PR uh, and just do that kind of stuff. So um, I, was, uh, I signed up, and I, I learned very quickly that if you take business marketing, it requires a bunch of business courses, <laughs> like economics, accounting, all of these things, which if you've known me for three seconds, you know this is not my wheelhouse, nor do I enjoy it. Uh, and so I had, this econo I had an economics class, 
I had this accounting class. I also met my wife at that time, and so I was spending a lot of time with her, not concerned about class at all. Um, I got the worst GPA of my entire life that semester, and my parents were helping pay for school at the time. They did not appreciate the amount of effort I was putting in uh, to that. But that's a second story. So I would go into accounting class, and we learned that our professor did not care at all about what we were doing in class. So eventually, every day, the class would start the same way. And this guy, no joke, he had a stain on the top right shoulder pad of every shirt he had. We don't understand. We're all guessing how that could be. But top right, brown stain, every shirt. And so he's there, and he would take roll. Hey, you here? You here? And say, yeah, we're here. He would turn his back to the dry erase board, and he would put a T-chart for credits and debits. Okay? And then he would begin to explain assets and liabilities. All right? He's working on this whole thing. We learned very quickly that if we stayed for a roll and left when he turned his back to do the T-chart, we would get accounted for class, but we would never have to be in class. Okay? So uh, me and my friend would leave our backpack on the, on the outside of the door. We would walk into class. Are you here? Nate Cruz here. Thank you. Turn to do the T-chart. Credits, debits. Uh, we would walk out from accounting class and never to return. Uh, it's a miracle. I think I actually got a D in that class. Okay, I didn't completely fail it all together. Uh, but we would skip class so much so that the one time later in the semester that I stayed long enough for the entire class, the teacher himself pointed me out as a welcomed guest in the class that day. He thought I was there on a recruiting trip for the university and that I was looking into being a student there. Uh, the friend that was with me literally fell out of his chair. He was laughing so hard. He couldn't believe this was happening. And so I had completely skipped. And once again, not affirming this behavior. If you're in college, please go to class. Uh, you know, especially if your parents are helping pay for it, please go to class. Uh, these are important. But what I want you to see today is that I did not value learning about gains and losses, losses, assets and liabilities, credits and debits, because I did not value what that would do for my life, so I didn't learn it and I couldn't apply it. And my fear is so many of us spiritually do not value or take the time to learn the assets and liabilities of a spiritual life. What are really gains and losses in my life? What adds to my life? What subtracts from my life? What is really in the gain category? What is really in the loss category? What is really an asset to my spiritual life or to my life really at all? And what is a liability to my life? And just like me, many of you have been avoiding learning this principle so that you wouldn't have to apply it. So that you wouldn't have to actually count the costs. And today, I'm going to walk us through this scripture with the idea of helping us see the assets and liabilities of a spiritual life. With the response, I hope that the Lord leads in your heart to let go of the things you once called a gain. To count them as loss so that you can pick up what truly is a real gain, a real asset in your spiritual life is to know Jesus. This is what we're after this morning, that you would let go of what you are currently holding on to. Because listen to me, for you to receive something from God requires that you let go of what you have for yourself. And you will not let go of what you have for yourself unless you are convinced and persuaded that there is something better to grab onto. And that's what I'm here to do today, to hopefully present to you something better Namely, a relationship with Jesus, a real relationship with Jesus. For some of you, hopefully it's the first time that you've even heard what it looks like to have a relationship with Jesus, and I hope to present that to you today so you can know what it is that you were made to be and to do to know him. And for many of you, my goal and my prayer is that the Lord would give you the right perspective on how you're living your life, that you would be renewed in your love for and dedication to and devotion to Jesus, that you would call a relationship with him and time spent with him a gain and that everything else would be a loss. So let's look at Philippians 3, 1 through 11. He says, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me, and it's safe for you. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. 
though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as a loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ." And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. As we're looking at this passage You ought to probably underline seven and eight as the central point by which he is talking. Why is he saying anything that he is saying in this particular section and really in this whole book? It all builds up to this point, but I want to work our way there starting in verse one. So look with me in verse one. First thing we must see is that we rejoice in the Lord. This is important. You need to start looking at paraphrases, start looking at the way things are said. In the Lord. Prepositions are so important for you to understand and work through the Bible. We rejoice in the Lord. And you may just fly past this, but the Lord doesn't want you to do that this morning. He wants you to prioritize and make sure that your rejoicing is in the Lord. Not in your circumstances, in your job, in your money, in your life, but in the Lord. We rejoice in Him And this is going to be so important for you to understand why he's a gain, because the only real rejoicing comes in the Lord. There is no rejoicing, real, deep rejoicing outside of Jesus, because you were made for him. And so now, if you want to get to the deepest heart of being happy, the deepest way to find joy is to rejoice in the Lord. To rejoice in who he is. To rejoice in what he has done for you. We rejoice in the Lord. And as we're going to see from Paul, we do not rejoice in ourselves, but rather we rejoice in the Lord. Look at this. He says, to write the same things is no trouble to me and is safe for you. I kept thinking about this phrase, same things. Same things. To write the same things. Then I kept thinking about how maybe, just maybe, our appetite for something new actually keeps us from benefiting from the same thing. He says, I have told you this before, but to write the same things is safe for you. And listen to me, my fear, because our culture is so obsessed with something new, is that you and I are missing out on spiritual growth. Because listen to me, spiritual growth is more about the repetition of the same things than the apprehension of new things. Spiritual growth is more about the repetition of the same things than the apprehension of the new things. Jesus says this to the Pharisees and Paul says this to religious leaders as well. You're always learning something new and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Because you're always learning something new. And even practically, this is why even in our groups during the week, which we call lighthouses, we talk about the sermon and we talk about the text from the sermon. Because the danger is we learn something new on Sunday and then we learn something else new on Tuesday so that we don't have to apply what we learned on Sunday. Because some of us call learning obedience. It's not. It's the first step. The repetition of the same things. And some of y'all get tired even in the way we do things. You say, every time I come to church, we pray, we sing, we, we read the Bible, we preach sermons. Every Sunday, it's the same thing. Yes, because that's what's safe for you. 
That's what's good for us to say we need the word of God. We need to respond to him in prayer and songs. This is exactly what the Bible has laid out. And for you to progress doesn't mean you walk around learning something new all of the time. Rather, for you to grow spiritually means you repeat over and over and over again the same things. The same things. But your love for new things has kept you from benefiting from the same things. I'm calling us today to be a same things kind of people, an ordinary, everyday, normal obedience and repetition of spiritual growth, to pray, to read the Bible, to trust the Lord, to sing songs to him, to share the gospel, to be a people of the same things. And I want you to know as well, obviously, we must be learning new things. The point is not that it is only about the same things. It's just more important to be doing the same things. The same things keep you safe. And maybe, just maybe, your lack of spiritual growth is a lack of repetition. It's a lack of repetition. This is why I say all the time, man shall not live by sermons alone. You cannot come here to get your ears scratched or your heart tickled on for a few little bit and say, okay, I learned something new. I'm good. No, no, no. The Lord wants to take you deep into his word that you would be a person of the same things. Repeat, repeat, repeat over and over again the very basic things of Christianity and what the Lord is asking you to do. The culture is obsessed with new things. But Christ is obsessed with the same thing. So let's be a people who follow after him. That's the first thing. The second thing I want you to see here in verse 3, we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit. So look, we rejoice in the Lord and we worship by the Spirit. It's just so important because Jesus came to say the same thing in John 4 with the woman at the well. He says that we worship in spirit and in truth. And the problem what's going on here is people base their worship off of external realities, what they could do, what people thought about them, but they did not base their worship off of an inward reality. And the Bible teaches us to worship from the inside out, from my heart to him, by the spirit of God working in me. But so often we base our worship out outside in. What song are they singing? How's the sermon? How do I feel on a Monday morning? And I'm calling you and the Bible is asking you today and commanding that you be a people who worship by the Spirit from the inside out. By the Spirit of God. You worship by the Spirit of God, which means you have to be in tune with the Spirit of God, which means you have to walk with the Spirit of God. It means you have to be intentionally thinking about what the Lord wants and what is he like. And what Paul is so mad about here is that there's a group of people that base their worship off of what they can do rather than having worship be led by the Spirit. We worship by the Spirit. The Spirit. So we rejoice in the Lord. We worship by the Spirit. And finally, here, just to cover a few basics in the beginning, we put no confidence in the flesh. Look at this. We put no confidence in the flesh. This is all working together, right? That we would rejoice in the Lord, not in ourselves. That we would worship by the Spirit, not by ourselves. And that now we would put no confidence in the flesh. And he's about to show us what he means by that, and we're going to work through that. But what he's basically saying is we put no confidence in the very best of ourselves, not the worst of ourselves. That's what you and I would think. Oh, of course, I don't trust these terrible things about me. No, no, no. He's saying the thing you're most confident in, the thing you do the best, the thing people love you for the most, the achievements you are most proud of, we put no confidence in those things. None, zero, not some confidence, not a little confidence, but no confidence. And what we're going to see from here, to truly gain Christ requires a complete surrender of everything else. To truly look at my life and the things I would call accomplishments and the things I would say that I'm good at. And to look at those things and to say they count as nothing before him. To put no confidence in the flesh whatsoever. And this is a stumbling block maybe for many of you in the room. What Christ is calling you from. I remember I was just talking to a friend the other day who was sharing the gospel with somebody. And she could not get past the fact 
that though she thought some friends and people in her life were so nice and kind and did good things with their lives, she couldn't believe that the people who were nice and served the poor and the needy, those people could be condemned and judged by God. Why? Because it's inherent to us to put confidence in the flesh. To say, if I can be a certain way, then I'm accepted before God. And what Paul wants to say today is, no, there is no chance. So if you're here this morning and you think being a good person or serving the poor or being nice or helping the, the, the poor and the needy or whatever it is, giving your money away, coming to church, all of those things, nothing you can do will make you acceptable before God, no matter how great you think it is. And even as a Christian, nothing you can do in the flesh merits anything before him, which is why it's so vital to learn to worship by the Spirit of God. And you, this isn't like a 30-minute thing. You can just learn why. You have to repeat the same thing every day in the Word, in prayer, being with the Lord to learn what does it mean to walk by his Spirit so that you can make sure you don't default into putting confidence in yourself. So I want to walk you through real quick what I think here biblically is the difference between self-confidence and God-confidence. Self-confidence is a trust in my ability to obey God or even in my ability to be a good person. So if you're here today and you would call yourself a Christian, the danger for your self-confidence is to rely on yourself in your ability to be the, do the right thing and obey God. And if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, what you would call self-confidence is just your ability to be a good person or to be someone of significance. It's a trust in my ability, what I can do. But the Bible gives us another category he wants us to work on. It's God confidence. Listen to me on this. God confidence is a trust in God's ability to do through me what he requires of me. It's a confidence for God to do through me what he requires of me. That if God wants me to be a certain way and live a certain life, it is not reliant upon myself to work that up or to overcome. But that as I position myself in the word of God and in prayer and in obedience to him, it's God's ability to do through me what he requires of me. Holiness. Activity in sharing the gospel with others. To be faithful, consistent. To bear the fruits of the Spirit, it's to trust in God's ability to do through me what he requires of me. But hear me, so many of you who call yourselves Christ followers are limited in your power because you're confident in the flesh. You're confident in what you can do. You trust in your own abilities to make a difference or to even do what is right and be a good person. And the Lord is calling us here, I don't think you understand how deep this is, to a complete, utter denial of everything I bring to the table, to count it all as literally nothing, worthless, helpless, of no value, and then to get on top of that to say the only thing that counts is what God can do in me and through me. And therefore, now I become motivated to repeat the same things over and over. Because if I'm not walking with him and loving him and pursuing him, I will, by default, rely on myself. you got to understand me, if you're here to a Christ follower, your default is self-confidence. Your default is self-reliance. Your default is I can do it. Your default is I can get through this. That's your default. I can do the right thing, be the right husband, be the right person. I can do that. And what the Christian's default ought to be is I can literally do nothing, and I must trust, rely on God to do everything. And therefore I position myself in dependence upon him. I've often said, and I think about this even for myself, to wake up and not spend any time with the Lord is to basically tell him, I don't need you. It's that serious. Just to go through your day and be like, no, nah, I'm good, I'm good. I learned enough last week, maybe listen to a sermon. I don't need to walk by your spirit right now, I'm good. I've got enough stored away. I know how to be nice. 
That's what you're telling God. You hear me? I don't care if you're a morning person or not, and I apply this to myself. If I wake up and don't devote time to him, I'm telling God I don't need you. That's what you're telling him. That is what you're telling him. I don't need you. I got this. I'm good. I grew up in the church. I know what the Bible says. There's so many ways in which we rely on the flesh, even as Christ followers, and God wants to just destroy that this morning to make you zero confident in the flesh and to give all your confidence in him. So are you walking in self-confidence or are you walking in God confidence? Now, here's what we're going to see as Paul lists out his list of accomplishments here, and I just want to summarize what's going on. Paul is basically taking a moment to prove that he had everything so he can explain that it was nothing. That's his whole, his whole, his whole thing he's going after. He's going to prove he has everything so he can explain he has nothing. Because you and I know the kind of people who get super mad and talk down to people that are successful to act like the accomplishments don't matter. And the reason they do that is not to discount it to prioritize something better. It's out of jealousy. And so one of the dangers people have here is Paul is just saying, man, don't count that for nothing just because he's at the bottom. So you look to the top, you're trying to bring people down. You're trying to say, well, that's not that big of a deal. Don't, you don't want to be that. And you're only saying that because you're not that. And so the motivation is selfish. And you and I both know this. And we, I, I had a friend who was in the music business. He used to always tell me that in the indie world or whatever, people would always make fun of pop music. But they would make fun of it precisely because they couldn't make it. Because if they could be rich and famous, they would. You know? They're like, oh, the song's on the radio. And he's like, if you could make a song to play on the radio and be rich and famous, you would do that. The reason why you're not doing that is because you can't do that. That's why the reason why you're not doing that, right? And so they're looking up, they're seeing something successful, and they're pulling it down to make it unvaluable or easy precisely because they're jealous. And so Paul has the danger here of pulling down these accomplishments because of that reason. So now he's proving... He's, he's the pop music maker. He's like, I am on top. So that's what he's taking time to prove. So you would hear him, so they would hear him, and so that you would hear him. This is not petty, and he is not jealous. He's proving that he had everything so he can explain to you that it is nothing. So he walks through, circumcised on the eighth day. So he's going to go through his religious accomplishments. That is the precise day you are supposed to be circumcised. He, that makes him, in the next part, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was born and bred a Hebrew of the Hebrews, the tribe of Israel. I mean, the, the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin. The tribe of Benjamin, though small, out of the 12 tribes, was one of the most highly respected tribes in Israel. And so it was a proud thing to be from the tribe of Benjamin. He is circumcised on the eighth day as to the law of Pharisee, which were the most respected religious leaders at the time who kept the law so precisely that obviously we see in the Gospels it became burdensome and was un-Jesus-like. But he was keeping the law as to zeal a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. And so what is he saying? This is important. He's, he has both religious and worldly accomplishments. Okay, it's not just in the religious realm because to accomplish what he has accomplished here and to be seen as this in society was a position of respect. So he had gotten to the top. He was the very best in his field. He was the most respected in his field. And not only was he the most proven, he was the most zealous. He had the most desire. He was hitting that gas pedal. He was proving everybody wrong every day. So Paul was at the top of the top. He had security. He had money. He clearly already probably had fame. He, had well, he was well-respected, well-renowned. He had made it to the top. Everything you needed to have religiously, he had. And everything the world would want, money, respect, and fame, he had. And then he looks at all of that, and he looks at it, and he just puts it all together. And he says, that's nothing, because I met Jesus now. You've got to feel the weight of that. What is he doing? 
In Acts 9, we see the, the story of Paul when he meets Jesus on Damascus Road. It's this one moment when Jesus reveals himself to him. And in that moment, his whole life changes. So now he looks at all his accomplishments and all his worldly success, being the best in his field, being a respected person, being secure financially, all of the things that you would aim for in life. He looks at it all and he says, that counts for nothing because now I have met Jesus. And I hope many of you can testify to the same thing, that when you met Jesus, everything changed. Everything changed about the way you saw your life, what you counted as worthwhile. Everything changed about the things you loved and the things you desired. So this is what Paul is after, and he's telling you, as every person even in the world now tells you, you make it to the top and you find nothing there. And then we spend all of our lives climbing to get nowhere. So Paul's preemptively helping you now to say you get to the top, it's nothing. The only thing that counts is Jesus. And this is not an exaggeration, and he's not saying it out of pettiness or jealousy. He's had it. He's had it religiously, and he's had it worldly, and it's not doing it. So verse 7, after Paul's explaining that, he says, what we just said, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. So here's what we're gonna do for, for a minute. This is what Paul did. Once he met Jesus, he had to reevaluate his life. Listen to me. The revelation of the Lord requires a reevaluation of our lives. If you get revelation, it comes with reevaluation. Do you understand me? If you get revelation, it comes with reevaluation. To meet Jesus and not significantly alter everything about your life is to not meet Jesus at all. A revelation does not just come as information for you to take in and do what you want. No, no, no. A revelation of Jesus, to see him as he is, demands a reevaluation of your life. A complete reevaluation of your life. And now this is where Paul gets into the gains and losses, assets and liabilities. And basically what happens is what he once considered an asset or a gain, now he looks at as a liability or a loss. And his complete categories have swapped over. It's just a complete reversal. It's a 180 to say what once was gain is now a loss. What once was an asset is now a liability. And now I have a few examples to help you really grab onto this concept, okay? I'm gonna give you a few. Maybe one of them resonates the most with you. But I want you to understand what does it mean to consider something an asset at one point and then for that very thing to become a liability and then I want you to apply it to your spiritual life. So here's a few examples so that you can grab hold of this. Okay, the first one. Having an asset that becomes a liability, it's like having a home, right, that you thought was an asset and then the market crashes but you have to sell it anyways. Now the home that was once an asset has become a liability because you can't get more than what you paid for it, which is normally the case that you would make some money in that way. But what once was an asset, market crashes, the environment changes, now the very thing you called an asset has actually become a liability. You need to move and now you're really in the hole because it's gonna cost you. That's one example. The next is buying a car for very cheap, Dave Ramsey style, in cash. But the repairs for the car cost more than the car itself. So what once was an asset, a cheap car, get me from A to B, has now become a liability. I am fixing it and paying more for it than it was originally cost to buy. What once was an asset now becomes a liability. And for those of you who have gone that path, you know, you know the way. You know the way. How about this one? Does anybody in here have a Tesla? Okay, this is not a, okay, nobody, all right, all right. I don't know if you feel ashamed about it. I'm just asking. Like, there's no, nothing wrong with having a Tesla. Uh, so imagine this. A Tesla, oh, that's a nice car, right? You charge it. You know, you don't have to go to the gas station. It's an asset in the city. Now, if you go on a road trip and you're driving a Tesla through maybe where I'm from, Alabama, or you're driving a Tesla just through the country, there's a lot of gas stations in the country that don't have charging stations, okay? This is not a priority for the country. So now you have a Tesla, which is an asset, 
but you run out of charge in the country and you can't charge it now. What was once an asset has now become a liability simply because your environment has changed. It works in the city, but it doesn't work in the country. What you called an asset now becomes a liability. I got one more for you, okay? And we spent a lot of time thinking about this so you could, you could get. One of these examples is going to work for you, okay? One of them, one of them. You got to get this point, forget everything else, okay? This is where I want you to really understand. Okay, here's my last one. Uh, last week, or no, two weeks ago, my wife was, he took, she took our uh, son, our, old, our oldest son, he's nine, to baseball practice. So baseball practice lasts forever because baseball lasts forever. And uh, listen, I love, I'm just used to faster sports, okay? Nothing against baseball. I'm just like, man, this is long. This is long. And they're nine. They're not good, you know? So it's long. And just like, let's, let's okay. They're getting better. They're getting better. So, uh, so she takes them to baseball practice. It gets over at like, you know, 9 o'clock, something crazy. It's just dark and everything else. And uh, she gets ready to come home, and she realizes that she must have dropped her keys in the field, like, okay, if you, if there was this, there's this huge field, and there's like four different baseball fields in the field, and it's just huge, huge field, and it's pitch dark, and the thing she would call an asset, her phone, has died. Mmm, I know, y'all are like, oh, I've been there. So what usually is an asset now is a liability. The phone doesn't work. No flashlight. She can't call anybody, so she's literally in a pitch dark field. She cannot find her keys, and there's one person left in the parking lot. So she runs up to this person and knocks on his, his car. I'm glad he was nice to her. Gave her her phone. She called me. I called an Uber. The Uber picked her up. It all worked out from there. The Lord provides, as he always does. But look, a phone we would normally call an asset, but when we depend upon it, it can become a liability. We're so used to it. We're so used to the constant access. You know what that's like to be down to a little bit of percentage, and especially if your phone dies, you feel like, I'm out. I might as well be dead. Nobody can know anything about me, you know? <laughs> they didn't feel like that like 20 years ago. They managed, okay? So now we're so dependent on a phone, and you can do so many wonderful things with it, like FaceTime my parents with their grandkids. It's wonderful. You couldn't do that 20 years ago. But the thing that we call an asset now becomes a liability, listen to me, when we depend upon it. And so it is, listen to me, with you and me, that once, what you once called an asset, the things you did to help somebody at one point, the best decisions that you've made, the things that you are most proud of, the resume that you would build, the things that you would be proud to tell somebody about yourself and about your life, your best characteristics, all the stuff you post on Instagram because it's the best thing about yourself, all of those things that you consider assets, the Bible wants you to now call liability. Not just nothing, but a liability. Because listen to me, if you depend upon that, that means necessarily you are not depending upon Christ. And if you do not depend upon Christ, you will not have salvation from Christ. And you will not walk in the power available from Christ. And what the Bible is after, what God is after, what Paul is after this morning is that you and I would make a category shift with our T-chart this morning and that you would put in the asset category everything that you like about yourself and everything that you're proud of and all the good things you've done in life and the amount of times you've gone to church and the amount of money you've given away and all the things that you would be blessed by. You would put it all in the assets category and then you would just switch it all over and say, if I depend upon it to merit anything with God, now it has become a liability because it is keeping me from accessing the power and the grace, and most importantly, the saving work of Jesus. The revelation of Jesus requires a reevaluation. So this is what Paul is after. So what are, you, what are you considering even now? What is it that you've relied on? Maybe some of you are here and this whole Christianity thing's new, and if I asked you, man, if you stood before God and he asked you, why should I let you into heaven, you'd, you'd pull out your resume. 
It's my favorite pastor question. And I always say, this is a pastor question, so I just set it up. You know, they're like, what do you do? I'm a pastor. They're like, okay, you know, it's a weird reaction. And then I'll just say, can I ask you a pastor question? They're like, okay, you know. Uh, and it's my favorite one. It's my favorite one. And 99% of the time, even when I talk to people who identify as Christian, which might be some of you, if I ask, what would you say if the Lord asked you, why should I let you into heaven? Everybody automatically, by default, pulls out their resume. And maybe that's what you would do right now. Be honest with yourself. If I ask you that question right now, what's your go-to? What do you think pleases God? What do you think is going to give you a shot on that day? Did you pull out your resume just now, in this moment? Did you think about yourself at all? Did you bring yourself to the table in that equation? God wants to meet you in that place and to say and to confront you with that and to say, hey, 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 if you brought yourself to the equation at all or pulled out your resume, then that necessarily means that you are not depending on Christ. The only answer is Jesus, life, death, resurrection. Some of you identify as Christians, but you're not relying on Jesus. And my fear for you is you won't find out until it's too late. So really, what's your answer to the question? What do you rely upon? Maybe some of you would answer that question appropriately, but you're not living according to that answer. You're still relying on yourself your view of yourself, others' view of you, what you can bring to the table. The Lord wants you to consider every good thing about yourself a liability if it keeps you from depending on Christ. So this is why Paul looks at it. Now it makes sense, right? He takes all of these wonderful things that seem to be good, and he says, now it makes sense, I count them as loss. Why? For the sake of knowing him. I count them as lost. Now look, this is important because this is not a progression of thought. This is not good to great. This is not a little bit to better. This is a complete surrender and reversal in life. It's to say I was once going one way and I thought one way and now I've completely changed my mind and I think an entirely different way. It's not like I was really religious and I got better by also trusting in Jesus. It was, no, I threw that in the trash can. Because it not only didn't help me, but it prevented me from Jesus. I wonder if some of you coming to church all the time is keeping you from Jesus. Because that's what you're relying on. That's what you're counting on. Serving with that is keeping you, I wonder, because that's what you're counting on. And he says, no, 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 no. I completely throw it in the trash. It's not worth anything when it comes to my acceptance before God. I count everything as a loss. And listen, I hope coming to church helps you grow in your faith, and I want you to come to church. So I'm not saying don't come to church. All I'm saying is I wonder if your religious ritual is actually blinding your eyes and keeping you from understanding your need for Jesus. Because you think your acceptance is in your behavior, and it's just not. That's what Paul's trying to reveal here. So now he says, I count everything as lost. And look, I love this because he's bundling, okay? So we all bundle. This is what you do when you get Verizon or whatever, okay? You bundle because it makes it better. It's cheaper. You bundle. And so we always bundle to get an advantage. But what does Paul do? Paul bundles to throw it away. He's bundling because he realizes that all of it is a complete disadvantage. I bundle it all together. I put all of it, right, my cell phone bill and my internet bill, and I put it all in the same place, not to get an advantage, but so that I can equally throw it all away because every piece of it is keeping me from him if I trust and rely on it. So he says, I count it as lost. You need to notice the, the, the verb tense difference here. Look at verse 7, I counted. Look at verse 8, I count. I counted is a past decision and a first time commitment. And some of you need to make that decision for the very first time today. And I count, hear me, for many of you in the room, is an everyday decision and a continual commitment. Now hear me, some of you once counted, but you have stopped counting. You counted, 
and you said, yes, I will follow Jesus. He's worth it all. But since then, you have stopped counting. Verse 7 is true, but verse 8 is not for you. And maybe the Lord is calling you to count every day a continual commitment to him. So why would we do all this? We lose everything, count everything as lost, put no confidence in the flesh, put all my accomplishments and good characteristics in the trash can. Why would I do all of that? Why would I consider the very best things about me a liability to my real, true happiness and success with Jesus? Why would I do that? Why would I throw everything away? Look at this. Uh, for the sake of Christ, indeed, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. This is the whole sermon. This is the whole point. The goal in life is to know him, not just know about him. And hear me, you settled for knowing about him and getting the information and facts correct. But God wants you to know him. To know him as a father. To know him as a friend. To know him as a savior. To know him as a provider. To know him as a comforter. To know him as a blesser. To know him as your joy. To know him as your grace and everything in life. To know him. To know him. To know him. To know him and not just know about him but to know him. And you guys all know the difference. The goal is to know him. Why would I throw everything away? To know him. Why? The surpassing worth. Because Jesus and knowing Jesus is the most valuable possession and piece of knowledge in the entire world. That knowing Jesus surpasses everything. It's the very best. It's the very thing you were made for. You were made not just to serve him, but to know him. Do know him. Do know him. And my fear for so many of us is we settle for knowing about him. I've learned things about him. I can tell you truths about him, but you don't know him as an experience and in a relationship with Jesus. The goal in life is to know him. And knowing him, Psalm 1611, in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. It's the best. There's nothing better than knowing Jesus. Nothing, nothing. This is not just religious talk or pastor talk. This is life talk. You were made by him and for him. No matter what you believe or think, you were made by him and for him. And the key to your life is knowing him. And therefore, everything is a loss. And listen, anything in your life that is preventing you from knowing him more is something you should throw away. It's not worth it. It's keeping you from the prize of knowing Jesus. This is why the sermon is called Let It Go. Because to receive something from God, you have to give up what you have for yourself. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss. Listen to me. You cannot gain without giving up. Jesus is not an addition to your life. He's the substitution for your life. Jesus doesn't come by addition. He comes by substitution. He's either everything or nothing. You can't just add Jesus to your life. Paul didn't add Jesus to his religiosity. He didn't add Jesus to his accomplishments. Jesus didn't come by addition. He came by substitution. He's everything or nothing. And you cannot gain him without giving everything else up. It's the only way. There's no other way. There's no other version. I don't know where we've taught ourselves. We can just add Jesus to our life. You cannot add him to your life. He must be your life. Listen to the scriptures, Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. It is not I've been crucified with my, my Christ. I enjoy adding him to my life so us two can live a nice life together. And it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Get this Colossians 3, 4. I think about this verse all the time. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. What a way to paraphrase that. 
He could have just said, when Christ appears, then you will appear with him. But no, 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 no. He's clarifying. When Christ, who is your life? Not an addition to your life, the substitution for your life. The only thing that matters in your life and the only thing that will make you acceptable before God. That's why as we continue here, as we're closing, Paul says, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Listen, for those of you who are trying to find yourself, the only way to find yourself is to be found in Jesus. You're trying so far to find yourself to be yourself, to come to realize who you really are, and that will never happen. It's a never-ending search. The only way to find yourself, your true self, is to be found in Jesus. Paul says, I count everything as lost that I may be found in him because it's not gonna help me on that day of judgment. Religion is what we can do to get to God, but the gospel is what God does to get to us. You need to have this category switch in your head when you think about your relationship to God and what Paul is saying here. I must be found in him. Religion is all the things Paul was doing, but the gospel is everything that God was doing. Religion is what you can do to get to God, but the gospel is what God has done to come to us. And look at the end here. He says, to know him and the power of his resurrection and to share in his sufferings that I may become like him. So to know Jesus is to know the power of his resurrection and for that power to be available in my sufferings. It is the very power of God and the resurrecting power of Jesus that's available to you and me in my suffering. So to know him is to know resurrection power, the kind of power I need, especially in my sufferings. This is so practical for us and so helpful. The goal is to know him. So look, I'm gonna close with this final example for you. Suppose I offered my children a check, just a check, a blank check, but I signed it. It can't get them very far, but it can get them okay. You know, they'll do okay. I offered them a blank check, but I required them to give me their favorite toy first in exchange. So I said, here's the check, but I didn't explain it to them what a check is or what a check does. I said, here's a check. I want you to give me your favorite toy and I'll give you the check. Now they're gonna look at that check as a piece of paper and say, you want me to give you my favorite toy for a piece of paper? And I'm gonna say, yeah. I want you to give me your favorite toy for a piece of paper. Now the reason that they would not want to make that exchange is because they don't understand the value of what I'm offering them. So they're holding on tight to their favorite toy because it's not worth the trade. Therefore, they won't let it go. But when I sit them down and I say, okay, listen, buddy, this check can buy a 100 of those toys. What are they gonna do? They're gonna throw that thing. They're gonna throw that, we're just out of here. They're gonna step on it, they're gonna do everything, and they're gonna grab that check and say, take me to Target. That's what they're gonna do. Why, why? Because what they once thought was a liability has now been revealed as an asset when its true value was known. And when the true value was realized, the obedience came from that. Was it hard for them to let it go? No. Did I have to grab it out of their hands? No. They were persuaded by the offer of something better. So this is what Jesus is doing in this room today. He's revealing himself as the better thing. And what maybe some of you have called a liability, that if I have to follow Jesus, I have to live this way or do this kind of thing or give this up, I would never want to do that. I don't want to, it's not worth the cost of following Jesus. I'll wait and make that decision later. Jesus is revealing himself as the greatest value to say, I'm worth it. I'm worth it. I am 100 million times better than the very thing you love the most. And so let it go. Let it go. Let it go. 
let it go, let it go, let it go. All the things that you hope and dream, let it go. All the things you're most proud of in your life, let it go. All the things you think you would present to God to please him, let it go. All of the things that you're most proud to come talk about, let it go, let it go. The things you're holding on to so tight in this world, your money, your resources, your life, your kids, let it go, let it go. Because God is offering you something better. And as soon as you see the value of Jesus, like Paul, you will happily, joyfully, willingly let go of everything else. This is what he's after here, and this is what we're after today, and this is what God is offering you this morning, the value of Jesus. So let it go, what you're holding on to, so that you can receive what God has for you. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for revealing Jesus to us in the scriptures. I pray, Lord, for each heart in the room, God, each heart watching online. Lord, this is a work that I cannot do, God. You must reveal Jesus Christ as the ultimate prize and possession of our lives. Oh, Lord, don't let us be like the children who see the check as a piece of paper who don't understand the true value of what's being offered to us. Lord, open our eyes to who you really are in such a way, God, that leads into a response of surrender and obedience to you. We love you. We thank you for the precious gift of Jesus. And in this room right now, we value you. We adore you. We say, Lord, and confess that you are worth everything. So now we worship you, Lord. May you lead us in our hearts to respond appropriately to what you're saying. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Why don't you stand and respond to the Lord with us.